And and so we're good. We're starting. I, I'm so used to academia where we're like, well, we'll wait another five minutes while people show up. No, we're going. Everyone's on time today. I will tell you a little bit more about myself. And I do this because it's a frequently asked question <laughs> when I talk to people uh, and I say like, oh, I, I do all these things. And they're like, how did you get here? Where did you get these skills? Like often this question is in the form like how can i be more like you leia and i'm like you don't actually want that you want to be more like you just a little bit of like sort of objective background information if you looked at my resume um these are the things that it would say i have done i was an architecture student and i was a facilitator at our children's museum here in pittsburgh um i've also worked for the mouse at disney um and so it's a kind of a varied past what these things all have in common is combining various aspects of the physical world with design and computation to try to make things that are interesting and fun. I, I care about fun, I do. It's a kind of a dirty word sometimes, but I do. So my research specifically is in a field called human-computer interaction, which is also not very specific. There are so many topics in human-computer interactions. My focus in particular is the last one on this list. It's computational fabrication. So. Anytime you're using a computer to help you make a physical thing, 3D printing, laser cutting, computer controlled mills, um, we can use these to make all kinds of physical things like entire bridges at sort of the large scale of, of size or furniture or food even, there are 3D printers for food. Um, and of course clothing, right? That's a little bit closer to what I'm talking to you about today. My own fabrication research particularly focuses on soft fabrication. For me, it particularly means I primarily work with fabric. I use fabric-based processes like knitting and weaving and sewing. When I'm talking to an engineer, I might describe the things I make as tensile structures or as compliant mechanisms. Uh, but I also do like to talk to artisans. If I'm talking to them, I might think of this as the fiber arts or a handcraft process. And then in terms of context, you know, that's all just sort of materials. Um, how can these things actually be used? I do like to think about fashion and costumes and garments. There are so many places fabric gets used, but let me give you a concrete example. This is, uh, I had a project where I was working on this, this very nice loom. This loom in particular is computer controlled, so it can make very complex weaving patterns, but it's also hand operated. So in this video, you see that I'm actually physically using my actual human arms to throw the wooden shuttle to add the weft yarn in each row. One project, is that I live streamed my weaving on Twitch and I invited my friends to watch me weave on Twitch. And I made a little web, web application, you can see sort of in the middle of the screen, um, where they could click on the pixels and they could change the weaving pattern while they were watching me weaving. Another project I did with the same loom, I took a picture of my own face every row that I wove, and then I made the pattern for the weaving based on that picture of my face. So over the course of the weaving, you get kind of a record of, you know, me moving around, right? It's like a little bit different in each, in each panel. Most of my publications have to do with knitting. So this, I promise you, is a video of a knitting machine. It's, I understand it's a very incomprehensible video with a machine like this. Um, I particularly use it to make soft little robots. And when I say robot, I am, I wouldn't call it an overclaim because it, it is true, but you might also like to think of them instead as puppets, right? A robot and a puppet are, are very similar concepts. So in this case, it's, it's a little string puppet you can pull on a string and it'll cause something to bend or to twist. And then also to help people think of contexts where this might be useful or, you know, even just funny, right? Or, or maybe sort of on the line between useful and funny. Uh, here's another knitting project. It's slightly more complicated um, than the one I just showed you. It's called a spacer fabric and it's kind of like a sandwich. We're looking at it face on. The zigzags are uh, monofilament fishing line, so they're a little bit stiffer than just like the yarn main fabric and they're also a little bit springy. Here it bends bends when I squeeze it one way, but then if I flip it inside out and squeeze it, it does not bend uh, in the other direction. So there's a little bit of asymmetry in the kind of underlying mechanical structure of this fabric that gives it an interesting mechanical behavior. And then also like in that robotics context, I might say that the whole thing is a soft assembly. So it's, it's a part that can be built into a larger robot for a specific purpose. I think a lot of times when we think fashion, we think of this, which is really cool and I love it. 
this is a runway show. This is for me a very foundational runway show that I think is obviously fashion and it's obviously technology. <laughs> Uh, so this is by Hussein Shalyan, and it's a set of shape-changing garments modeled by models, right? This is high fashion on a runway. This is a project that was done by a high fashion designer in, in cooperation with an entire team of mechanical engineers. This is a project that also still positions itself as fashion. It's a little, you know, it's not a runway show, right? It's a little bit more makery. It's something that they clearly built in, in a lab. Um, but it's still something that is very intimately involved with the body. Uh, on the left, it's taking um, muscle impulses and uh, taking those, those uh, impulses and turning them into various motions of, of the shoulder piece there. I would say clothing is anything that mediates between a wearer and the environment. So physically, keeps you the right temperature. <laughs> it keeps you safe, right? It keeps you from... Um, rubbing your skin on things unpleasantly. There's all kinds of like tactical reasons we wear clothing, right? So like someone who is a mountain climber or a welder um, or a lab technician, often they're using clothing as a very important part of their, you know, protection, personal protection equipment. Um, it also integrates storage, right? Pockets, they're rad. And then there's all this social stuff around fashion too. It, it changes what you look like, right? It changes also what you see. Most of our day-to-day -day clothing doesn't do that as much but um you know when i'm wearing a suit it really kind of changes how i move my body it, it maybe means if i want to look over my shoulder i'm actually moving my whole torso this is a paper by a friend of mine who i think is super smart all the stuff that a robotic garment might do and she starts by looking at all the stuff that existing garments already do um and sort of the the ways in which we engage them so yeah thermal regulation they keep you the right temperature right um some therapeutic compression, right? Especially in a clinical context, right? Things like helping um, your muscles and blood pressure work correctly. So these are things that normal garments do already that if you're thinking about how can like technology hook into these things, maybe these are things we could enhance. Maybe these are things we can work with or against. And I'm using the phrase as a site in a kind of art world sense. So often um, an installation artist might tell you that they, they're using a particular site um, for an installation that they're producing. And when they say that, they mean both the physical place that something is, and also all of the cultural and emotional and aesthetic implications of that place. But I think it's a really wonderful and concrete example of what I mean is like body as a site and the space immediately around the body. This is a little purse that you can unpack and make this tiny little space it's just for you and one other person. And I've actually had several drone roboticists tell me in great detail exactly how bad of an idea this is. <laughs> but uh, um, as a concept, I think it's interesting. And, and, you know, so we sort of explored it with animations, right? Because it's not something we can really make in reality, reality. Um, but thinking about like, what would it be like if the fabric, not just immediately on your body, but kind of near your body, were doing these things to greatly change your shape and greatly change what you're seeing what's you know can you see behind you can you can you see in front of you even right uh are there things that you're holding that are concealed etc it's also a project where i was thinking about how clothing can sort of aggressively mediate how how you exist in the world this is a cooked up example but um you know, basically the story here, I'm at a party and nobody likes me. And so I would like to not be at that party now. And I'm going to make myself a little space in my clothing um, where I don't have to deal with people. That someone said, you know, I wonder if that could be someone helpful for students to experience sensory overload. I think that is very much where this project was coming from, right? This idea of like, I want to like step back for a bit, um, you know, in, into myself. In general, I like to think about fashion specifically as these kind of personal and contextual soft interfaces. And this is partially me as a human computer interaction researcher. We talk about interfaces a lot. So here's again, one that's like a little more like obviously researchy. This is the same researcher as I showed you earlier, the, the Monarch shoulder system. It's a photographer, a photographic artist from the seventies named Cindy Sherman, whose work is entirely about these kinds of like ways of manipulating her own presentation in the world. Most of her, her work is just like a single image, but I really love this sequence 
where she's doing kind of like a slow morph across various personal presentations. Far and away favorite artist is Nick Cave, who is most well known for these projects that he calls sound suits. He's very explicit about the ways that thinking about these sound suits, producing them in the first place, and then iterating on how they should look, absolutely comes out of his experience as a person, um, specifically as a black man in you know contemporary reality and ways in which he might like to be bigger or smaller or more active in some situations or less active in other situations and how he can kind of mediate that through uh, these costumes that he can wear. This alternative limb project is an ongoing project. Um, it's primarily one researcher, but I wanted to give it that kind of project name because there are several other folks involved as well. Um, where she does high-end prosthetic limbs, specifically makes them incredibly personal to that person. So this limb is for somebody who loved the idea of being a spy with like super spy gadgets, right? That has like all this additional functionality. And this one's a little bit at the, the edge of maybe what I'm talking about because it's just the head, but <laughs> the head is, is, is important. Um, and I also kind of included this just because again, this is an artist that I think is very worthwhile. Um, Lee Wilkins, who also does a lot of kind of cyborg and hobby electronics projects, depending on how the lighting is, you know, you can either see the other person or not see the other person. And so it's very much a using that kind of on body interface as a way of thinking about how social interactions work even more than any other kind of uh, fashion. I encourage you to take a look at how fashion does already exist in the world, so the existing languages of fashion, right? The genres or the, the kind of um, literacy that, that people who regularly work with in fashion think about. So just a couple of things when you go out into the world and you look at what people are wearing, some things to notice is silhouette. Uh, I specifically chose all the images on this slide because they are all mostly black. Uh, the fabric is mostly black, but obviously these outfits are super different. And that is like item number one in your fashion vocabulary is silhouette. You can do a lot with just the way that fabrics are shape shaped around a body, the volumes that, that fabrics achieve. This is really what I was trying to get at with that drone project, by the way, silhouette. I think it's really, really instructive when you go out in the world and look at what people are wearing to see the ways that colors are composed meaningfully. They can often draw attention to the silhouette, right? So the one on the left here, the colors are more similar to give a kind of a more overall homogenous look. The <laughs> one to the right of that, it's very explicitly broken up. The sort of closest to my heart, the closest that I think closest to what I've been talking about is to think about the materials that are being used. In this slide, the one on the left, it's a very thin, translucent, lightweight, drapey fabric. Um, it's sort of ethereal, right? It's helping this artist tell the story of something maybe a little bit underwater or dreamy or drifty. The one just to the right of that, the bright red, it's a very like stiff, fabric. It's a fabric that has um, a lot of body of its own. It's what helps that big shoulder silhouette even happen um, because it's shiny. You're really seeing all of those little wrinkles and things, right? It's it's the perfect fabric for that dress. It's a, it's a wonderful correspondence. Moving on from there, there's these metallic accents. It makes it almost like a robot look, right? This is almost like a kind of a post-human uh, aesthetic. Um, and then the one to the right of that, I, I just think that whole that whole fabric is really fascinating. It's a, it's a really interesting piece of fabric. I think that it's literally just a square of fabric that this person has put over their head. And it is so interesting and cool. So there's a lot of creative depth that's happening here just in the materials.